1 Kings 19. I don't know that we'll ever get out of Kings 19 and Kings 18. But uh, I know that, and you'll, you'll see that theme come through the message today, but when we sing that song today, in your presence, I am changed. In your presence. You know, so often we try to run from the presence of God when things are not good or when things are not going right with us. You are not changed that way. You're changed in the presence of God. It's hard sometimes when you feel condemned or when you feel like you're not where you should be to remain still in the Lord. I understand this. It's our human, it's the humanness inside of us, but it's in his presence that you are changed. Amen? Always remember that because the devil always tries to get you outside of his presence. Because he knows that God keeps on changing you. So I want to minister to you on the subject of touched by an angel. Touched by an angel. How many of you remember that series, Touched by an Angel? It ran from 1994 to 2003 with Roma Downey and Della Reese, uh, the smart aleck angel, if y'all remember that. I mean, everybody just couldn't wait to that moment that Roma Downey glowed, you know. And that was going to be the revelation of turning somebody's heart. But she was playing the role of an angel. So I want to share that today with what Elijah experienced by being touched by an angel. 1 Kings 19, 5 through 8. Then he lay down and slept under the broom tree. But as he was sleeping, an angel touched him and told him, get up and eat. He looked around, and there beside his head was some bread baked on hot stones and a jar of water. So he ate and drank and lay down again. Then the angel of the Lord came again and touched him and said, Get up and eat some more, or the journey ahead will be too much for you. So he got up and ate and drank. And the food gave him enough strength to travel 40 days and 40 nights to Mount Sinai, the mountain of God. He was touched by an angel. The word for angel here in our passage is malak, which means a messenger or an angel. In fact, this is the same word for angel that was used for the messenger that Jezebel sent to Elijah warning him of his impending death. It's the same uh, Hebrew word uh, for angel. Fortunately, in our text, the uh, second time the word angel is used in verse 7, it identifies the angel in our text as one that came from God. It was an angel from the Lord. How many of you know that Satan has his messengers from hell? that are armed with fiery darts of doubt, despair, disbelief, discouragement, and, despair, and disillusionment to try to get you and I to give in to temptations. Amen? He's there to do that. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 6 says this, Above all, take in the shield of faith with which you will be able to, to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. You see, Jezebel sent a wicked, fiery dart messenger to Elijah to let him know she was going to have him killed by the end of the day. But God sent another Malak, an angel from him, that was an angel to bring healing and restoration to Elijah. You're always going to have the two involved in your life. The enemy will always be throwing fiery darts to get you to give in to temptation. But God will always have ministering angels around you if you would be willing to listen and to be still that will give strength and hope to your heart. Amen? It is there and we need to understand that. You see, when it talks about those enemy darts, those fiery darts. In Ephesians, the Greek for fiery dart is belos. It means a fiery missile, a fiery missile that is coming your way. That's what Jezebel sent in her 
Malak, her messenger, she sent a missile to take out Elijah. Has any of you ever felt like the devil sent a missile your way to take you out? You ever felt like that he sent in his arsenal something to put you on the sideline you see Satan here in our text unloaded an onslaught of missiles in an attempt to get Elijah to give up on the mission that God had ordained for him to carry out for the Lord and that's the reason the angels from Satan the the demons might, we might call them in a sense the fallen spirits have been sent to get you off the path and we see here Elijah it has, has deviated from where he should be. He is running at this point in his life because these fiery darts are coming at him. These fiery missiles are coming at him. You know, Peter said to think it not strange concerning the fiery trial that is to try you as though some strange thing had happened to you. You need to always remember that when those missiles are coming. It's not a sign that you necessarily deviated from the truth of God's word. It may just be that you're getting close to the goal of accomplishing what God wants you to accomplish for him. And the devil is going to find every way that he can to get you out of the way. You know, King Saul in the Bible he was a missile thrower. He, was a, he, was, he had darts that he was throwing. In 1 Samuel 19, he tried to pin David to the wall when David was playing praise and worship music to keep the demons off of King Saul. And the spirit of Satan overtook him, and he drew back and threw a spear or a missile at David to take him out. In 1 Samuel chapter 20, King Saul even tried to kill his own son, Jonathan. Because he took up for David his best friend and he launched a spear at him to try to kill him and even to take him out. This was the devil trying to kill what God was doing. In 1 Samuel 17, the giant Goliath, he came against Israel's army. He carried a spear. He carried a missile. Listen to me, folks. This spear was huge. The Bible says the end of his spear weighed 15 pounds. Imagine that. 15 pounds, and he could hurl that and take out. He was a spear thrower. However, David had another missile. It was a little old bitty rock. Hallelujah. And he put it in that slingshot and he began to whirl that thing around and when he turned it loose the anointing of God got hold of a five ounce rock to destroy a man holding a 15 pound spear I've got news for you when you're walking with God today you don't have to worry about the devil's spear throwers and those that are trying to take you out look to God hallelujah he'll use the rock in a stream to give you victory he'll use whatever's needed to see that you get through to your destination Anybody with me here today? Praise God. That's what God wants you to see today. I'd rather be standing with a five-ounce rock under the anointing of God than I had holding a 15-pound spear with the, under the control of man's humanity. Amen? And the world don't understand this today. Our government don't understand this today. That it's with God that makes a difference. Amen? And when we stand with him, he moves with us in a mighty way. It's interesting to me on Elijah's journey that Elijah is never rebuked by God or the angel never rebuked him for his showing of weakness. No rebuke anywhere for this. I, I'm enthralled. I've always been enthralled by studying Elijah and Elisha. These are, these are men that are worthy of heroeship. These are men who are worthy of emulation of the lives that they live. But something strange has happened to me over the years as I have studied Elijah and Elisha as my heroes. The more I study Elijah and Elisha, the more God becomes my hero. Hallelujah. The more I study Elijah and Elisha, the more God has become my hero. Because I've seen what he was able to do in the lives of people who were on the top of the pinnacle and who fell almost as low 
as you could go. And God was there to help. In fact, not only, listen to this, because you need encouragement today to know when you are touched by God and touched by an angel, that what God will do in your life. So he was no rebuke for him when he ran from Jezebel. No rebuke when he left the man that was his helper stranded there and he took off for 40 days and 40 nights to go to Mount Horeb or to Mount Sinai. In fact, not only is he not rebuked, but God gives him several epiphanies. He gives him several revelations. An epiphany is a revelation or a manifestation of the supernatural in some way. It could be an angel, it could be a being, it could be a revelation. But he gave him epiphanies, revelations instead. We, he, we see that when he goes to the mountain of God, when he's there in the cave, God came by. The Bible says that the, the wind, the earthquake, and the fire all happened when God passed by. So they were a result. I know the final analysis there it says that God was not in them, but God caused them. Amen. God caused them to happen. He was in the still small voice. But he revealed to him his wonder and his power and his great grace. And I got news for you. I don't care what you're going through today. I don't care what it is that you've come up against today. I'm here to tell you that God is with you. And even in your weakest moments, even in the times when you're most down, he's there to give you an epiphany of who he is and what he is and what he can do in your life. He is your Savior, your Lord, your Master, and your King. Amen. He's there to uphold you. He's not there to squash you. He's not there to put a spear in you. He's not there to shoot a missile at you. He's there to give you an angel if he needs to, to help you in your life. Look, Psalm 103, verses 13 and 14 says this. The Lord is like a father to his children, tender and compassionate to those who fear him. For he knows how weak we are. He remembers that we are only dust. Aren't you glad of that? Amen. He, he, he is a father. He's tender and compassionate. You may have not had a father in your life who was tender. Those of you that listen to me live by Facebook here today, you may not have had a father that was tender or just or right before you. But that doesn't change what your heavenly father is. He is the one who can heal the broken promises. He can heal the letdowns. He can heal the sorrow because he's a God that does not change. And what he is yesterday, he is today, and he will be forever. You see, God knew that Elijah did not have to run. But Elijah, like most of us, allowed his fears to move his feet in the wrong direction. And even though he did, God still revealed himself to him. God knew that Elijah was going in the wrong direction and that his journey to Mount Sinai was an unnecessary detour for him. Yet in his tender mercy and compassion, God provided substance for him in order that his body would be healthy, even though at this moment his mind wasn't. Hear me now. He's running. He's out of the will of God. He's going the wrong direction. And God, not only when he gets to Mount Sinai, provides revelation for him, but before he gets there, he sends an angel to cook a meal for him. What does that tell you about your father? He sends him to give substance for his body that is weary and wearing out. So God did not do what a lot of us would have done if we were God. Boy, you'd do a lot of things if you were God, wouldn't you? Amen. I, I know you, you know, going down the highway, whatever, you'd say, boy, if I was God. Mm -mm -mm. Every time we say that, it usually ain't good, right? Amen. It usually means I'm going to get somebody. I'm going to pay somebody back. We're going to even the score, praise the Lord. You know, if I were God. But so God did not do what a lot of us would have done if we were God about Elijah. We would have said, well, it was Elijah that took a wrong turn and got off the right road. And you know what? 
I'm God, so I'll be waiting on him right here when he comes back to resume his journey where he got off the path. That's the way we're done. We'll say, he left me here. Praise God. I sit here and just wait till he comes back. And when he comes back, we'll resume this journey. And what did God do? God went with him. Because in his presence, we are what? Changed. In his presence. It's not God sitting over here and saying, bye. God's going to go with you through your faults. God's going to go with you through your failures. God's going to go with you through your weaknesses. Why? Because in his presence, he changes you. Hallelujah. I'm so glad that God does not stop and wait for me to come back again. Amen. He went with Elijah and he provided for his needs until he could get him spiritually and physically healthy again. And I want to tell you, God will never leave the path that, that you're Even if you're on the wrong path. Somebody say amen. Even if Elijah was on the wrong path and God stayed with him. Because he wanted him mentally and spiritually and physically well. And I've come this way to tell you and anybody else that will listen today that God will stick closer to you than a brother. He will be there with you to guide you and to guard you into everything that comes your way. Amen? Look, you may be able to run so far away that Jezebel's hands cannot reach you. But when you're a child of God, his hands is upon you no matter how far away you run. Amen. Somebody, you want some scripture now, don't you? Psalm 139, 7 through 10. Where can I go from your spirit, the psalmist said? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend into heaven, you're there. If I make my bed, where? Where? In hell. He says, behold you. How many ever felt like you've been in hell before? You know you ain't, but it sure felt like it. Amen. Praise. If I make my bed there, if I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost part of the sea, even there. Somebody say even there. You know, you're, you're somewhere you ought not to be. It's even there. You're, you're not in the place you should be. Even there. I, this is the second Sunday in a row. I'm preaching better than you shouting. Amen. Even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. Uh, hallelujah. Some of y'all are just too saintly for this message. I can tell right now. Praise God. You shined up your halos before you got in the car and you headed to church because you were Mr. and Ms. It got it all together. But for the rest of you that ain't, hallelujah, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. Hallelujah. Oh, praise God. I want you to get this in your spirit. Look, so he's going the wrong direction, but God's going with him. In John chapter 21, Jesus, this is where, in John 21 is where Peter wound up saying, all right, we ain't got nothing to do now. Jesus is gone. We go fishing. You know, y'all remember that story. In John 21, Jesus knew his disciples' feet were running in the wrong direction because he didn't call them to fish for fish. What did he call them to fish for? Men. And now they're going the wrong direction, the wrong way. And he knew his disciples' feet were running the wrong direction due to frustration. But like Elijah, Jesus did not rebuke them. This is so important for you to see. I'm not trying to preach to you that there's not discipline from God. I'm not trying to preach to you that, that God does it because he does. The Bible says that if a father loves his children, he'll discipline. If he don't discipline, he don't love them. I'm not talking about that. I'm trying to get you to see how much Jesus will stick with you because how, does he, how, does he, how is he able to discipline you the best? When he's with you. Amen. That's how parents discipline their children. When they're with them. You know, as long as my parents were over the phone and uh, several thousand miles away saying, when I get home, well, I got time. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. But when you're with me, you can take care of that. So Jesus did not rebuke them, but he also gave them some epiphanies. I mean, here, 
Peter, here he's giving people revelation and their, their feet are on the wrong path. What does he do? He lets them go out in the lake and they get no catch of fish and then they get a great catch of fish and then they get breakfast. God's over here feeding Elijah with an angel. All the food that he needs and he's going the wrong direction. And now 11 of the disciples are going in the wrong direction. God gives them an epiphany because sometimes he don't let you catch any fish so he can show you his miracles when it does come in. Amen. And then when it's all over, the Bible says he had breakfast cooked on the shore for him. Mm -mm -mm. Praise God. You see, Elijah's epiphanies affirmed to him that while God was indeed spectacular, he was also a God of the stillness. He was, he was a God of what was spectacular, but he was in that still small voice. The disciples' epiphanies taught them that God is still at work for them, whether the nets come up bare or they're bountifully full. God is in it with you, whether there seems to be nothing or whether they seem or whether they're full. Paul made this so plain in his life, whether he had nothing or whether he had everything, he still had God, which was everything. Listen to Luke 11, 11 on this. It's so important to understand how a father operates. He says, let me ask you this. This is from the Passion Translation. Do you know of any father who would give his son a snake on a plate when he asked for a serving of fish? Of course not. Do you know of any father who would give his daughter a spider when she asked for an egg? Of course not. If imperfect parents know how to lovingly take care of their children and give them what they need, how much more will the perfect heavenly father give the Holy Spirit's fullness when his children ask him? How much more? Praise God. He didn't say whether, whether they was on the right track or the wrong track because the truth of the matter is sometimes you on the right track and sometimes you on the wrong track. Anybody here on the right track 100% of the time? Okay, then this applies to you. He's there to keep you and to guard you in your life. Jesus also knew the prodigal son's feet like Elijah and the 11 disciples were headed in the wrong direction. He was a son of the father and he took off and went the wrong way. But there is not a single mention of a rebuke for the prodigal son from his father for wasting all of his inheritance on him more living and landing in a hog pen hungry and desiring to eat the pig's food. Again, don't misinterpret what I'm saying about going the wrong way, that there's not consequence. I'm just telling you I'm looking at a relationship here today and how God is trying to restore and to get people to understand who he is. He did not condemn and he did not rebuke, even though... They were not doing what he wanted them to do. In fact, in hindsight, we see what his father was doing while his son was living in rebellion. His father had positioned himself next to the road that leads home so as not to miss his son if he decided to come back home. Uh, and the Bible says one day he was still hanging around that road. He didn't want to go anywhere too much, and he saw that boy coming. Hallelujah. My God, he run out there, and he cut him down. He said, you sorry, no good rascal. He said, I gave you all this money. Now you put me in a hardship financially. You about as dumb as a stick, son. I'll tell you what, I ain't never seen anybody like you. No, 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 no. The Bible says that he ran out there and hugged him and vehemently began to kiss his boy. Hallelujah. He had a robe to put on him and he had shoes to put on his feet and he slipped a ring of authority back onto his hand because that's just the way your father operates because it's called grace and mercy and compassion from God. 
Hallelujah. So it gives you encouragement whether God's got you in the role of an Elijah, whether he's got you in the role of a prodigal son, whether he's got you in the role as one of his disciples, whether it's none of those, it doesn't matter. In his presence, he's got you held. Oh, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Mm -mm -mm. Luke 15 and 20. Let's just read the scripture. So he returned home to his father while he was still a long way off. His father saw him coming, filled with love and compassion. He ran to his son, embraced him, and kissed him. Hallelujah. Then, like God did with Elijah, the 11 disciples, by feeding them a meal of grace, when their feet strayed off the right path. You see, all those other boys got to eat. The 11 got to eat. Elijah got to eat. And he had a fatty calf for this boy. He'd already prepared the fatty calf. Hallelujah. They was going to be a party this afternoon. Amen. Do you see how God works? You see how God works? God, God not only wants you physically whole, he wants you spiritually whole. Spiritually whole and physically whole. And he's the God for every person that you are. He had a fatty calf prepared for his son that was once lost but is now found. Does that bring anybody encouragement here today that if you was away from God and came back and he didn't condemn you, rebuke you for it, but instead he just found a way to reveal himself to you and, and serve you a meal? That's pretty, that's pretty amazing. That's pretty amazing. You see, if you've been touched by an angel or God's providence, his grace and mercy, refuse to be a missile launcher. Now, I want you all to hear this. Refuse to be a missile launcher when someone else through weakness gets off the path and fails and then all of a sudden they get fully restored like nothing had ever happened. You'll get mad because you've always been faithful and don't think it's fair that our Father acts like nothing bad happens. How in the world could you let somebody back home and not make a public example out of them for it? Instead, he looks just like he did before he left. He's got clothes that are royalty on. He has nice shoes on. He has a ring on his finger, and he's been restored back. You see in Luke 15, you hear the missile thrower, 29 through 32. But he replied, this is the elder son of the prodigal. All these years I've slaved for you and never once refused to do a single thing you told me to. And in all that time you never gave me, never even one young goat for a feast with my friends. Yet when this son of yours, how you like that? Yet when this boy of yours, like it ain't your brother, comes back after squandering your money on prostitutes, and we're still trying to figure out from the word of God how he knew that his younger brother was messing around with prostitutes. Maybe he just so nosy he went down to where he was at to try to find out some stuff, you know. So he said he squandered your money on prostitutes. You celebrate by killing the fatty cat. His father said to him, look, dear son, you have always stayed by me and everything I have is yours. Listen to me. When somebody falls and they fall hard and God puts them right back, were they supposed to be all along? Don't you get mad. Get glad. Because everything he's always had has been yours. You have not been lacking nothing. But we seem to think that. He said in verse 32, We had to celebrate this happy day, for your brother was dead and has come back to life. He is lost, but now he is found. Hallelujah. That's salvation. That, that, that's getting saved. You didn't deserve this salvation no more than I did. Nobody else around us that we received it. We didn't work for it. In fact, you can't work for it. You can't earn it. You can't do enough to please God for it. You must accept it for what it is. It is the gift 
of God to us, freely given. And it's the only way for us to go to heaven. For through his blood, through the door, which is Christ himself, that is how we will come into an everlasting residence with the King of kings and Lord of lords. And we shouldn't be begrudging anyone. You see, here's the pattern of grace from God that is especially encouraging to our walk in Christ, especially when we make mistakes and fail. Oh, I, I guess I really need to make sure. Does any of us still make mistakes and fail? And, okay, a few are great. Praise the Lord. So the message is right on target. So here's that pattern of grace from God when we make mistakes. Elijah strayed from the path and had wind, fire, an earthquake and then he had a small voice to talk with him it was the presence of God the 11 disciples strayed from the right path and also went fishing had failures and flourished all in one night but when the night was over they had fellowship and a restorative conversation with their Savior on the shore the prodigal son strayed from the path he went from having riches and reverly to being ruined and when it had ended he had a conversation with the father that put him back on the right track what's it all about it's all about the presence through all their ups and downs, faults and failures, what was it that made these three men or situations better and blessed? It was the fellowship and the company with the presence of God. Right now in America, we need his presence more than anything. We don't need more Bible teaching. We don't need more preaching. We don't need more dogma thrown at us. We need the presence of God. In Exodus 34, 14 through 16, Moses and the Lord's having a conversation about his presence. And the Lord replied, I will personally go with you, Moses, and I will give you rest. Everything will be fine for you. Then Moses said, if you don't personally go with us, do not make me leave this place. Verse 16. For how will anyone know that you look favorably on me and on your people if you don't go with us? Brad and Christy, would you come? For your presence among us sets your people and me apart from all other people on the earth. Your presence. It's not our preaching. It's not our PhDs and DDDs and whatever they are that we attach to our name that we try to impress people with our knowledge and stuff. It's the presence of God. Elijah needed that presence. The 11 needed that presence. The prodigal needed that presence. You need that presence. I need that presence. We need to understand that even when you get off the path today, he'll still be there, his presence. And if you'll acknowledge him, he'll go with you. He'll convict and he'll convince, but he will not rebuke. And he will show you his power even in the midst of your failure. And he'll provide a meal for your spirit and a meal for your flesh. Hallelujah. Hallelujah you can get strong again in the power of the Holy Ghost you have been touched by an angel amen you see the scriptures the scriptures remind us now I'm not going to walk away from this message without this here uh, in Psalm 91 verses 9 through 11 he says if you make the Lord your refuge if you make the most high that's El Elyon by the way El Elyon is the Lord most high he said if you make the most high your shelter no evil will conquer you no plague will come near your home for he will order his angels to protect you everywhere that you go how many of you are cognizantly aware that you got angels around you every day now i don't believe in worship of angels no more than the bible teaches us not to do that but they're there 
to help you. They're there in your presence to keep and to guard. In fact, Hebrews 1.14 says, What role then do angels have? Here's what he said. The angels are spirit messengers sent by God to serve those who are going to be saved. Hallelujah. And so when that angel just touched him, the second time he said, Elijah, he knew he was going the wrong way. God knew he was going the wrong way. No, we're going to change Elijah's mind. He's going to Mount Sinai whether anybody likes it or not. That's just what he got his mind made up. He's going to do it. But the next, the second time that angel touched him, he says, get up and eat. It's, it's kind of interesting as I was studying this. The word for coals there, and, and I was trying to study out the Hebrew to find, in fact, some of the people I was studying by said the word cake is not mentioned. It's just hot coals. And it's assumed, of course, that he ate bread. But that's the same word for coals that his bread was on. Is the, that I think it's only twice that word is used, that it was in Isaiah chapter 6 when Isaiah had the hot coals that were touched to his lips. And the jar was only, that word, the Hebrew word for that jar was only used two other times in the Word of God. In the second place it was used, referenced the jar of oil that Elijah spoke to the lady that would never run out to the time she went back. And God had Elijah on a mission that just like Isaiah, who got re-emboldened, he got recommissioned, because Isaiah, when those coals touched his lips, he said, Here am I, Lord, send me. And God sent Elijah to Mount Sinai, or he went to Mount Sinai, and from Mount Sinai, God recommissioned Elijah to go do several things we'll talk about in the days to come. But it's understandable that that jar never run out, because for 40 days and 40 nights, that man went on nothing but what he drank out of that jar. And I got news for you. That's how powerful your God. That coal speaks of sanctification. It means purification. It means setting ourselves aside for the presence of God Almighty. But God is there. Jesus had angels to minister to him. When, when, when he was at the, the wilderness temptation, when the wilderness of temptation was over, the Bible says angels gathered around him and refreshed him. And renewed him when Jesus sweat the great drops of blood in the Garden of Gethsemane the Bible says the angels came and ministered to him after that decision was made look it's all through God but we can rejoice at every station whether it's an angel whether it's the Holy Spirit whether it's God himself it all comes from God and I'm telling you here today I'm telling you that are listening to me live by Facebook today that your God, if you know him, if you've accepted him as Lord and Savior of your life, he's not going to leave you. He's not going to desert you. In fact, he's going to go with you. Because he knows that his presence can change you. Can change you. So don't be afraid to give your weaknesses to God. Don't be afraid to give your frailties your fears and your frustrations because that's what God taught them by giving every one of them an epiphany a revelation some type of manifestation of his power to show them that he was still in control while your heads are bowed today hallelujah maybe you're here today and you would say Pastor Jeff you see your feet you, you, don't necessarily zero in on the feet sometimes because sometimes your mind can get away from you this is what happened with Elijah his mind got away he, he allowed frustration and fear and anxiety to take him down a path that would not have returned him had not God been with him and I'm going to tell you something it's taken me down that path before but God was with me and God worked an out. And God will work an out for you. Those of you that listen to me live right now, God, God's got a way already prepared. You're struggling. You felt those missiles being lobbed and thrown against you. You felt those fiery darts. Ephesians 6 
says for you to lift up the shield of faith for it will quench every fiery dart that the devil sends your way <laughs> hallelujah he can't have you he can't control you he cannot winch the peace of God from you he will lob those missiles to get you to forsake it but if you will come to understand God is there and he doesn't move he goes with you all the way to the very end that's the God that we serve and maybe you're here today in this building and you're saying pastor Jeff I need to either mentally, physically, spiritually return back to the right track. But I understand that God is with me now, Pastor, more than ever. And I want to take his hand. I want to know that he's there to minister to my every need and to my physical as well as my spiritual and my mental. He's there. And if you will let God have control again, he'll bring you right to where you need to be. He'll put you right on the right track. Amen. If you're here today and you say, Pastor, I need God's strength for that journey right now, would you just slip your hand up and say, Pastor, pray for me? Is there one in this building? Is there one in this building? Thank you. Amen. Anyone else? Anyone else? Hallelujah. Let me ask you this while your head is still bowed. Is there somebody you know right now that is going through the fire that is really personally struggling either physically mentally spiritually or emotionally and you would say pastor jeff can we not today just lift up and believe god for a breakthrough if you know somebody right now just slip up your hand and just say amen look all across this building amen praise god father i'm not even going to delay in the name of jesus in the name of jesus i feel an anointing from your holy spirit i feel an anointing from heaven right now to pray in the name of Jesus, this word has gone forth. And I pray for this word to be born on the wings of an eagle, to be born on the wings of an angel, to be born on the wings of the Holy Spirit right now, the dove of God. I pray that the Spirit's power will flow into every home right now upon, and light upon every individual. I pray for the manifestation of the Spirit and the power of God to be revealed before them. Those epiphanies right now that they will know that their God has not and will not and shall not ever forsake them but that he will go with them to the very end. I pray for healing to come. I pray for the undercurrents of the wind of the Holy Spirit to lift them up right now, to break, to break the pull of Satan, to, to, to deflect the fiery darts that the enemy is sending their way to tell them it's no good, it's over, there's no hope. I bind that in the name of Jesus, and I pray in the name of Jesus for perfect health. I pray for perfect healing upon the sake. I pray for healing, oh God, upon the spirit. In the name of Jesus, those of you that are listening to me right now through means of a live stream, in Jesus' name I speak over your life. Jesus is the answer. The cross is the answer. The blood he shed for you on Calvary's cross, it is the answer. There is no other name given under heaven whereby men shall be saved but the name of Jesus. And when he's inside your heart and your soul, no matter where you go, whatever you do, his goal is to get you home, hallelujah. And if he has to meet you in a hog pen, if he has to meet you on the road to Mount Sinai, if he has to meet you on the road to a fishing trip, he will because his goal is to let you know you are my child, hallelujah. You're my son, you're my daughter. Get that today and know that I am the Lord your God. Oh, Lord, in Jesus' name, minister to these hearts today and work miracles. Work miracles. May our texts light up and our phones light up with people saying, God answered. God broke through. Hallelujah. The power of God. Hallelujah. Has made the difference in my life today. 
Oh, I pure be keshara bahan robohore hila ra 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 di obosha. I feel God right now. I feel the Holy Ghost just bearing us up. We need His power. We're weak without Him. We're we're insufficient without Him. But you can sit down at His table. Hallelujah. He'll cook breakfast. He'll cook coals on a fire. He'll do whatever He needs to do. He'll kill the fatty calf because you're his. Oh, hallelujah.